no, actually, no, I don't think it happens at all. It makes no sense for the 49ers. I don't think at this point they will ever get the return on investment that matters. I think it's more likely he signs an extension a la Debo Samuel a couple years ago than it is he gets traded. This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome back to another edition of 21 Questions, our podcast here at KCSN, where you guys ask us questions and we answer them. We are brought to you guys by Braden's Hope for Childhood Cancer this week. And I am elated to be joined by the, the OG, one of the first people that you guys probably saw cover Chiefs online anywhere, Seth Kaiser, m Chiefs fan. Welcome. This is our first time, besides for the breaking news team, I think, sitting here and recording something together for KCSN. So I'm kind of excited about this. I am excited too. It's just like the old days. We got to find something that we disagree about so that way we can just like argue about it until Tucker basically turns us off, just like we used to shut down Arrowhead Pride threads. Just like comment after comment. Have you thought about my six paragraph response? Here's my seven <laughs> paragraph response. And I love it oh, and I miss it, man. It's so good to talk to you. I got a mechanical keyboard so they can even hear me type too. We can just like, yeah, we can just type it out. Click, 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 click away. Um, we're a little bit of a time crunch today, so we're going to start firing off these questions right away. Just as always, right at the top, these are all your questions that you guys are asking us. If you don't know where you can do that, you can do that on the KCSN Discord. When you join the KCSN Substack, you will get an invite to our own personal Discord. It's a lot of fun. Everybody enjoys it there. And then there is a channel for you guys to ask us questions. You know, if that doesn't work, you can leave us comments. You can do a five-star review with a question for the following 21 questions. Another great idea. There's other ways, but the easiest way is on the Discord. And with that in mind, Simu7, first question, when is Seth going to get on the Discord? <laughs> What is a Discord and is it fun? I uh look, I I I know a little bit what a Discord is. Let me just tell you guys this right now. So the joke that that Maddie and I were just making with each other, um, many of you who follow maybe used to lurk the comment sections at Arrowhead Pride or maybe were were constant participators in it. I can just not even begin to exaggerate the number of hours that comment section stole from my marriage, my children, my career, and everything I've heard about the KCSN Discord is that it's that great. And I'm trying, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'd have a lot harder time finding someone if Jazz left me over over talking Chiefs all night on a keyboard again. So I, I'll try to get in there at some point, but I just got to be careful because I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, at this point, I'm like, you know, I'm like six years sober. From that sort of thing. <laughs> so see, it, I it, that's a good thing. I, it is kind of like the old message. Where I think it's more like Twitter, but like a controlled Twitter. Because it's not everyone's there. It's not open to the masses. So it's like a controlled version of Twitter where you can have good conversations or you can write paragraphs and try to goat somebody into talking with you until 3 a.m. about, <laughs> oh, I don't know who the best eighth wide receiver on the Chiefs roster that isn't going to make the 53-man team is. And something like that. These are the um, important questions. C. Moose also had another question. How many days does it take Brandon Ayuk to actually get traded? And so, really, I'm just going to ask you, do you think Brandon Ayuk gets traded any time this season? I don't. Um, there's maybe a possibility right before the trade deadline. I don't think the Niners are really that. They're not going to be that motivated, and they, they view themselves as a Super Bowl contender, and they should. They're not going to have Brock Purdy for cheap much longer. Um, this is the time. There's not a trade they could make that makes them better this year. And people can talk about draft capital and that kind of stuff, but ultimately I think they know that Ayuk, I mean he's got he had a uh, he had a first round contract but it's a late first round contract. So he's made like 12 million bucks or something. This year I think that that fifth year option was like 14 mil. You know, anytime and this is this is the control that teams have with that fifth year option um and with the franchise tag with guys that haven't made I, I understand 12 million is a lot of money. It's not necessarily super generational wealth, and that's what these guys are looking for. And you, if you can double that in a year, they know he's probably not going to actually sit out, so they're not going to be that motivated. He knows the system. They're not going to worry about him missing training camp. They went through this with Nick Bosa. Yeah, and they did it with Debo Samuel a couple of years ago, too. He oh, actively held out and didn't sign his deal, I believe, until like the end of July, maybe even August. Like It was late in the yeah. like, training camp. It started once Debo Samuel had signed, so... The 49ers, I don't think, are uh, brand new to this. They've dealt with this before. 
I think they'll call the bluff. And for all we know, like this is just Ayuk trying to get more money. He's looking at all yeah. these other contracts. He could just be trying to get money. And like this request is just that. Or, hey, maybe he does throw in a hissy fit and wants to go play with Jaden Daniels in Washington because they're sharing those bubble screens um, from their practice tape or whatever it was. Uh, so yeah, I I don't think he gets traded. Um, if it does happen, no, actually, no, I don't think it happens at all. It makes no sense for the 49ers. I don't think at this point they will ever get the return on investment that matters. I think it's more likely he signs an extension a la Debo Samuel a couple years ago than it is he gets traded. Um, we have a couple yep. more IU questions here. Frank the Tank, how much do you think, if he does get traded, how much do you think it would cost to get Brandon Ayuk? Not specifically for the Chiefs, just in general, what would Brandon Ayuk go for if he were to be traded for? I mean, there's a precedent out there with the Hill trade, um, the the Brown trade, you you've got some precedent. Here's the deal, though. That it, 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 is Ayuk? What man? He's really good. He's so so good. I don't know. I feel like he's like this teeny tiny tier that separates him from those guys or from like Justin Jefferson. There's this tiny tier, and and also I don't think it's a coincidence that Tyreek Hill was kind of like the peak uh, that you saw on a return, and then you saw a little bit less with Brown. And I, I think teams are realizing maybe a little bit, and I could be wrong here, because uh, I think Miami's happy with how that trade went. But I do wonder if teams are realizing a little bit that as much as a wide receiver can tra- change your fortunes, trading the absolute farm for them and then paying them $30 million a year, that's not a great long-term team-building strategy. And so I, I think you'd have to find the right combination of team that thinks it's ready to contend and has a ton of assets. And those those teams are rarer than people think. Nate talked about this a lot when everyone thought Chris Jones would be on the block. It's harder than you think. People, all oh, 30 teams would be interested. It's usually like three because there's just not a lot of teams that are in that team building phase. Yeah, and so like you mentioned Hill and Devontae Adams also like these guys are going for a first. Now Adams is a little older, but like still, he was really good at the time. They're going for a first and a second for Adams. Hill got what a first and a second and a couple others because it was a late yeah. first. Um that's I think that's too much for Brandon Ayuk, but if you're the 49ers, you're probably not trading him for much less than that. So like that's why I go back to I just don't think it happens. And I just don't think anybody is going to be willing to give that up, especially now. Like you're and if you're the 49ers, you're taking a draft picks for a draft that's not going to help you this year when you're in the middle of a Super Bowl window. It just seems unlikely to me. The only way it would ever make sense is that I guess you get to the trade deadline and the 49ers are completely floundering and they just go, okay, we need picks to rebuild this up. But yeah. cost-wise, I mean, it's a first plus. I don't know if it's the same as Hill or Adams, so it might not be that first and second kind of value at the end of the day, but it's definitely going to be a first and then something on top. Um, yeah. And then the most simple question, and everybody wants to know this, is from a- Andrew Sch- Schnicker. Whew, always got to be careful saying that one. Brandon Ayuk, question mark. Um, I assume this one. Do you think the Chiefs should attempt to trade for Brandon Ayuk is how I've taken this question. Um, I They they wouldn't be willing to to give what, would, what it would take. If Brandon Ayuk were just a free agent, I would struggle with the idea of the Chiefs paying him a market rate salary. Like, I, I think I would if I were them. I think I would. But doing that plus giving up at least a first... That's just not how the Chiefs are built. I think 2022 was proof of concept that with competent, and that's the difference between 2022 and 2023, with competent receiver play, because MVS was better in 22, Juju added more than people realized, just by being competent, just by being a competent, man, I'm so glad Hollywood Brown is on the roster. Anyway. (laughs) I know which area of the field to run to. It's a win. It's a huge win. Um, and, And just... I can occasionally win against man coverage in some situations. These things matter. And and so, but they showed in 2022, they had the best offense in the NFL with a meh receiver core. That was, it, I would, I'm not even sure I'd call it average. Maybe average-ish. Once you throw in Kelsey, then it's average to above average. But it they've got proof of concept there that as long as they've got Kelsey, and I think the 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 way people talk about him last year, I think it kind of overstates well you know he lost a step he lost that step like four years ago guys like he he looked just he looked like himself just surrounded by a much worse situation and so as long as you've got Kelsey you've got Reed you've got Mahomes you don't need that elite guy you just need a basic level of competency and if Worthy is who they think he is they know who Rasheed Rice is and Hollywood Brown is just who he's been his whole career they have actually 
more than that level of competency. So I just don't see them being willing to pay that kind of price um, for a number one receiver. I think the only way you're going to get a, an Ayuk level guy or to even ratchet up a, a tad more, getting another Tyreek Hill, whatever, is if they draft him. So maybe Worthy is 110% of what they're hoping he is. That's how they end up with a guy like that on the roster again. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I'm kind of in lockstep here. He make a lot of sense to the Chiefs because he does a lot of what the Chiefs really struggle with. He separates from oh, his yeah. man coverage. He's actually got some of the best, like, separation metrics for people that track, you know, that in the NFL right now. He's one of the best at it, and he works at all three levels of the field, and he kind of does yep. everything that the Chiefs are missing. However, at the end of the day, I think we've seen the Chiefs don't need that guy at that much money. So them paying that much money to get that guy and also giving away draft assets seems highly unlikely. It doesn't seem like the way they're doing business anymore. I know they did it, right. you know, there early on in the Brett Veach era, but it seems like they backed out of that. And even then, it was for like leaders and culture setters along a defense that was really struggling, not yep. to add weapons around Patrick Mahomes, who is the leader in the culture of the offense. Before we move on from Ayuk, I did know you mentioned this pre-show, so I was going like, to let you go off on this a little bit. You you want to talk a little bit about uh, how Brandon Ayuk struggled against the Chiefs' corners in the Super Bowl just oh, a little sure. bit, and maybe where they might, uh, you know, just like how Jerry Steen and Trent McDuffie clearly impacted what Brandon Ayuk wanted to do in that game because they were being yep. a little overly physical with him. Like, hey, you could have thrown more flags, but it's a Super Bowl, so we're not going to throw him. He struggled with the physicality of the Chiefs' corners. Do you think that is something that, you know, might come into play for a front office like the Chiefs if they were willing to want to be interested in him if he was available? I think it would to an extent. And I, I understand people will say, well, you know, they were able to, you know, mess with Tyreek Hill as well. I mean, Sneed, I loved watching how Sneed got officiated last year. It was so great to watch because you give that guy like the Legion of Boom treatment and he will just chuck guys around. It's so much fun to watch. Um, and Trent McDuffie, I, I, I've been screaming and people are, you've really come around last year. Trent McDuffie, I think is, is, is arguably a top five corner in the NFL. He's just so good at everything. So you, you don't necessarily want to ding a guy for struggling a bit against really physical, really good competition. I would note most of Ayuk's mate, I think all of them, bigger plays in the Super Bowl came against some form of zone look. It wasn't, well, you know, when they, when they went to zones, Purdy did a good job finding the holes. They did a nice job with it. There weren't a lot of snaps where he was just beating man coverage. Both McDuffie and Snead generally got the best of them. I think the thing I would say, like when I say that I think Ayuk is really good, but I'm not sure he's quite in that that one tier. I don't know if you see that similar thing. I would call it maybe like the Stefan the Stephon Diggs tier. An unbelievably good receiver, because there's so many good receivers in the league. But one that you can win against with man coverage with an elite corner. I don't know. I think if you like, let's say, let's say the identical situation in the Super Bowl, but instead of Ayuk, it's 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 AJ Brown. I think he still gets his. I think Tyreek Hill probably still gets his. I, I think Justin Jefferson still gets his, even though they're they're going to be muted. And the Chiefs secondary was so good last year, <laughs> but I, I do think that affects it to an extent because you've got your number legit number one star level receivers, and then you've got your 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 next tier there. And I just don't think he's quite in that tier. Yeah, no, actually, I, I'm with you there. I think it, he's a clear wide receiver one. And he's exceptional, and he's in the top ten wide receivers in the NFL. But he's yes. not. He's not at the point to where he's knocking on the door of the elite of the elite. And I don't know if there's a step left for him to take to get to that point. Like he's kind of, he kind of seems like what he is. And I think that Super Bowl was a great indication of that. It's like, yeah, Brock Purdy maybe wasn't perfect. Maybe C. Spagnuolo dialed up a lot of the right stuff. But generally speaking, it seemed like he was struggling with the physicality when teams were allowed to beat him up a little bit. So I I, I like that. I like that thought here. Um, here's one from Kyle C. Now we're transitioning away from Brandon Ayuk, which is nice here. When you go to training camp, what positions do you naturally gravitate towards? Is it trenches, quarterback, skill guys? What are you looking for? Um, I'll answer this one real quick. For me, the way training camp is set up, you can actually watch uh, skill position one-on-ones to start it, and then you can transition over and catch the trenches You know when they start doing their one-on-one drills. Or and then once team starts, you're obviously watching team, but they usually don't run one-on-ones of wide receivers and corners and of offensive-defensive line at the same time. They usually end up getting split off pretty well, so you can kind of catch both. Yep. Hey, you just got to kind of know when to walk to one corner and then to the other corner because mm-hmm. it's always in two different corners, like back-to-back. Which seems we have that weird second to me. field right now, and they yeah. put the wide receivers over there a lot. Like that's annoying. Yeah, it's like I, I come on, man. Like I'm just trying to watch here. I actually, I, I hate to be too agreeable, but that's exactly right. You can do both. I, I, I do think 
the the trenches and the wide receiver and corner one on ones. Those are the few times you can kind of get some semblance of something out of it. When they're in pads, you know the the team drills are good, but it's also worth noting. That, I mean, they're always working on something. And I, honestly, I'm going to forget this midway through training camp, especially the first day they put pads on. But I always just tell people, you can take a very little bit away from a, a padded practice, but taking away too much, you just don't know what's being worked on. I will say um, the the one-on-ones in the trenches, to me, kind of mean the most. Not necessarily even, you know, who's winning, who's losing. Because, like, like, some of those one-on-one drills you know, you've got an offensive lineman in complete space in a way that he's never going to be. We're like, but like that, that allows you to say, so let's say if a uh, Sudamata Ia is dominating some of those one-on-one reps and pads, those are hard reps to win. So it kind of means more on that end than it does on the other end. So little things like that are kind of what I look for is like, how are they winning? Like when Chris Jones was a rookie and he came into training camp and he was, he was chucking guys aside. Then you're like, oh, okay, that functional strength in college, that's going to translate. So I look more for traits and that sort of thing yep. in those moments. Yep. I think that's good because you also like, you never know what they are doing in their drills. Like you never know what's right. being worked on. So just finding guys that are outliers compared to the others in terms of how they move, how pads sound when they hit them, whatever it may be is also like probably like the best tip. If you're trying to get something to take away from it. Uh, Casey from Casey has a question for you. I guess he's probably heard me talk about this before. So he's interested for me though. Which position or positions do you think will take meaningful steps forward this year? Which position or positions will take meaningful steps forward this year? I, I think the obvious one is wide receiver because that's more personnel changes. Um, they've they've really gone out of their way to add to the variety of that position group um, in terms of, you know, MVS can separate deep sometimes. You know, and that's that's where he goes, though. Can he separate deep, shallow, or intermediate? Almost never. And so, you know, he's going to run there. When Juju was on the roster, well, he can separate shallow and intermediate. He's not going to separate deep. They they, they they seem a little less segmented and a little more like, like Hollywood Brown is so underrated. Like, everyone sees his 40-yard dash speed. He works best intermediate levels of the field. I love him as a fit with Mahomes. I think it's such a good fit um, because of the way he wins. He basically just weaponizes his deep speed to set up intermediate stuff half the time. So I think that's the most obvious answer. Um, in terms of of a step forward, I'll just say a player instead of the whole position group because you know the yeah. linebacker core I'm excited about. Leo Chanel is interesting to me because he the, the way that he wins. I was curious if they would be able to continue to expand his role in year two, and they did. Spags keeps finding ways to use him, and with Willie Gay Jr. out of the picture. I think people underestimate, because he was such an athletic freak, just how much of Willie Gay Jr.'s job was to be that that Sam guy at, at, at the line of scrimmage. And Chanel, he fits really well for that. It's it's what he does best. So I'm excited for that to see if he takes another step forward and maybe develop somehow a little bit of change of direction ability in space. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, that would that would change that would change a lot for the team there to go from being like a you were being a box cutter to like a multi tool. Like we can do more than one thing here with him now, yeah, right? Just, um, just a little bit would be because the man when he's closing, like even sideline, sideline, like man, you look like a great athlete. People would show me that his um his RAS scores, you know, they showed me yeah. side by side. They're like, look, he's just like Willie Gay. I'm like, have you watched them play? Because they are not. <laughs> I listen, just drive a double decker bus out there, and he can jump up there and pull himself up. We're all good. Like you don't need to yeah. turn. Just go over. You just go over. You don't gotta go around it. Yeah, yeah. Who's 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 going around that guy when you could go through him? And hey, you know, you watch the Super Bowl. He was one of the unsung heroes there you know, on the edge against Kittle, who couldn't do much against him as a run blocker. It was fun to watch. Yeah. All right, we got one more here. We are not one. We got a couple more. But here's this next one from Layton Y44. If you could pick one Chiefs player, not named Patrick Mahomes or Travis Kelsey, to bunk with at training camp, who would it be and why? Uh, I, I got my answer. My I'm taking Trey Smith. Um. I'd bunk with Trey Smith. I think we'd get along really well from everything that I have heard from people who have talked to him, from what I've heard him have interviews. I think that he has more interest than just football, but we get, we get nerd out about football based on people that have talked to him about a line play. We can get very nerdy with it, but he also has interest outside of it, which I think is fun. Obviously, he knows how to eat well, so me and him can eat. I don't have to feel like, you know, awkward about myself wanting to eat five meals a day or order $86 worth of barbecue for just myself. He would get it. He <laughs> understands me. Uh, so yeah, Trey Smith's a pretty easy answer for me. Sure. 
Um, I I would have a a fun answer and a dad answer. The 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 fun answer. I I think Justin Reed seems like a really interesting dude. Okay, and I he just I I really enjoy the idea of of you know he he really approaches things a lot more intellectually than I realized before he came to Kansas City, and I think he would be an interesting person to you know just chat with. Like you said, you know you want someone that you can talk things other than football. I mean football is great. But it would be nice to have someone you could talk about life with a little bit and, you know, you know, future plans, that kind of thing. I think that would be really interesting. Dad energy me and lawyer energy me would be Rasheed Rice. So I could talk to him for a little bit and say some of the same things that I've said to my son, who's way closer in age to him than he is to me. And I'll leave that at that because I think I think I could help just like you and me. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk about this. <laughs> we're stuck in the room. room. There's nowhere yep. you can go. Yep. Uh, perfect answers. Perfect answers. All right. We have more questions for you guys. We'll be right back after this quick break. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. With big wireless providers, what you see is never what you get. Somewhere between the store and your first month's bill, the price you thought you were paying magically skyrockets. With Mint Mobile, you'll never have to worry about gotchas ever again. When Mint Mobile says $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, they mean it. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. Mint Mobile is here to rescue you with premium wireless plans starting at $15 a month. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone in any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with your existing contacts with you. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's deal and get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash kcsn21. That's mintmobile.com slash KCSN21. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash KCSN21. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, so we are back with 21 Questions brought to you by Braden's Hope. And did you guys know that 47 children are diagnosed with cancer every single day in the United States alone? At Braden's Hope for Children's Cancer, we are working to make this a difference in this fight against childhood cancer. Braden's Hope funds cutting-edge research to find cures and safer, more targeted treatments for childhood cancers, but they can't do it alone, guys. So you got to join us in the fight against childhood cancer. Your support can bring hope to families and save lives. Visit Bradenshope.org to learn more and get involved. Together, we can make a difference. Again, that is Bradenshope.org. This is for all of you out there. This call is out for everybody. Everybody can help even just a little bit. It would go a long way. All right, we are back. We got a few more questions here. We got one coming in from Bone Jackson. We got to lighten this up a little bit now. Seth clearly enjoyed gelato on his European vacation. I, I don't know why it's clearly enjoyed gelato. I, did you talk about this for a little bit? Is that why? Is that why? Guys- it, it, it would have been easier to find time on the show. I came back where I wasn't talking about gelato. <laughs> so that's that's what I hope they mean. Other than that, I mean, I think I weigh about the same. One of the, either way, either way, there's truth to it. Have you no? Wait, okay, here's the real. This is my follow up question. Have you found any gelato near you that's even close? To his- no. No, yeah, it really ridiculous. gelato is one of those things. We we did like a cooking class, um, and the guy basically explained that the thing with gelato is it it takes time to do it well, and <laughs> we we here in the states are not big on that all the time. I'm sure there's probably good places, but I, nothing that even comes close. Okay, all right, <laughs> that that is fair. I agree. I've had gelato in the in, in the U S. It's it's fine, I guess. Um, who in case this is Bone Jackson's question here. Who at KCSN would be the best hang at Oktoberfest? For your information, he'll be there on Wednesday through Saturday leading up to the Chargers game right before the bye 11 straight Oktoberfest without catching a Thursday night game. That's awesome. You're getting to catch a game. I mean, come on. This is one answer only. Craig Stout is the only answer for Oktoberfest. Like, not only... That is literally what I thought. 
Yeah, and see, he's not he's not only is he gonna know the most, he's a he's awesome, he's fun to hang out with, and I can just let him choose anything I'm gonna drink because he's never given me something I don't like. And I've seen him give I have seen him recommend different stuff for all sorts of different people, and he is always spot on with what people are gonna like or not. It's like I, I don't know. If you have any other answer, please, but like I think Craig's the easiest answer for this one. Craig's a really easy answer in that. Um I he's he's and he's just a, a genuinely decent human being who is is interesting to talk to That's and great. and has a <laughs> and has a fund of knowledge that is just, I don't uh, it, it's so f- interesting hearing him just casually mention things and I just want to be like every time like even just in little group chats like little moments where you see him tweet something out or mention something on your on the lab when he's with you guys I'm just like how do you know this stuff like what how do you fit it all in there? Um, but yeah, so that that's the easy answer is Craig. Yeah. No, I, I, that's right. All right. Here's a good one from Christian Gummer. These are my favorite types of questions. So I love that Christian always gets one of these bad boys in here. Would you rather be three inches taller, but have the same length of arms you do now or be the same height you are now, but your arms are three inches longer? So you're gaining three um, inches. Where do you want it? But it's got to be height or arms only. Yeah, yeah, there's 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 a, there's a lot going into this question. Well, as a guy who is who is who's 5'10 on a good day, I and my arms are actually um it's like a Kaiser family trait. My arms are actually a little weirdly long for my height. Okay. So this would actually be a perfect fix for me. Um and then plus, you know, what would I be about 6'1 then? You know, walking around at 230 when you're 6'1 is very different than walking around at 230 when you're 5 510. So that that's an easy one for me. Make my arms normal. That would be that'd be incredible. Give me human arms and I'm three inches taller. Done. See, this, this is a tricky one for me because like my first thought is, OK, which one of these would have assisted me at playing sports, you know, when I was younger, even now. But like when I but like when I was being more competitive with sports, which ones would help me? Like if I was three inches taller, that would be definitely helpful for something like basketball. I don't know if it would have changed anything for my football playing career. Right. Like I have decently long arms, but they're not ridiculous for my height. So three inch longer I, arms though for football because you were in the trenches, right? Yeah, I was, and that's like it. I'm going with the arm length here. I think I'm yeah. going with the arm length here. I think if you make me three inches taller, but I keep my arm length, I'm like uh, Christian Braun Brown, whatever the Kansas basketball player for the Denver Nuggets. I'm like his dimensions almost at that point in time, and like I don't have a jumper quite like that. So like it does me no good to be like that tall yeah. but with short arms. Like what am I doing? Yeah. What am I doing with all this height? Now I just gotta yeah. duck under. I gotta hit my head on more things, but I don't even get the the benefit of longer arms. <laughs> my my oldest no, son is about six four now, and he 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 liked being six one six two, and so I think what's <laughs> once you start pushing six four six five, life starts becoming real inconvenient real fast. I feel like there's a sweet spot because like I, I'm probably about like six two and a half ish, despite you know everybody voting me on Kent's poll to be the same height as Tucker at like five three. Six two and that's because you're shredded. All right, you know what? Let's not do I this. You shredded like, in shape jerk. I feel like once you get over six feet, they're like anywhere from like six one to six four. It's probably more inconvenient than helpful to be that all because you start hitting your head on stuff, but you don't. You're not like Paul yet. Like yeah, you're you know you're not like just tall, Craig. Tall guy. Everyone knows Craig how tall he is, and that's cool to be that tall. But now you're inconvenient, but tall. I'm just not sure, but it's inconvenient because I hit my head on the back of the car door. I hit my head on the light over the kitchen table, like everything. I, I don't. I'm telling you, short people don't even know they they got a they got a great Tucker. Um, all right. Oh, from Isaac Q. Seth, what is your favorite part of Charles O'Menahue's YouTube videos? Okay, Matt, do you know the background of this? So nope. only weird That's games. Li- only weird games listeners are jerks. So I I make it. I love you guys. Comment. You guys are great. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Only weird games are our watchers, is what we call them. We we have watchers and voyeurs. We don't we don't have uh, listeners. So okay, I make one comment one time that I'm a little bit skeptical that Charles Amen who will be able to come back by week one. Well, he he tweets a fair amount about the doubters and the haters, and people started tagging me. I don't think Charles Amen who is aware that that this is like a bit. And so now, anytime he tweets about his YouTube video, people are responding, oh, real Minnesota Chiefs fan is in shambles right now. You know, when are you going to address how much he hates you and thinks you will never play again and stuff like that? And so I think all of it is great, and I support it, and I think he's going to be back soon and just as good as he was last year, where he was a wildly important part of the Chiefs Super Bowl run. Please stop tagging me when Charles Amenit posts. It's gone on long enough. 
Goodness gracious. So when, epi- so when his fourth episode was delayed a couple days, like, you know, you thought you won. You thought yeah, you were thought it's... Yeah. Yes. My my victory was finally assured. Uh, it's just, it's been a thing, man. And eventually, players don't always find bits like this funny. And so eventually, I'm, I'm going to get dunked all over and been called some old fat lawyer guy. It's going to be a bummer. It's going to hurt my feelings. And I'm going to pretend to laugh. I'm going to be the living, you know, smiley mask crying behind it meme when I get dunked on inevitably by Charles Amenahu because of you people. (laughs) All right. We got a couple more. We're going to lightning round through the last couple ones of these here because I know we are running out of time, guys. So let's say Joe Tooney has to miss some time to start this year. Who would you like to see fill in at left guard if he misses, let's say, the first four games of the season? Man, pickings are slim at this point. (laughs) Yeah. I you know I kind of like you you go first because I I okay. I have to I have to think about this because yeah. you're basically probably going with a rookie. Yeah, so and rookie's an option. Um, I'm actually going outside the box a little bit, so I'll leave the rookies for you. I, I like Mike Caliendo. I you know some of his gameplay hasn't been oh. great, but like I like the athleticism he provides. He allows you to keep, keep the screen game, keep some of the outside run game because he's an athletic guy. And replacing Tooney, you're not replacing the powerhouse that is Trey Smith. You're not replacing. I I don't want to mean that Trey Smith's better than Tooney, but like like for like skill set, I think Caliendo kind of fits closer to Tooney's player sure. type than he does Trey Smith. So that makes mm-hmm. sense. Then my sleeper, and this is, a, you know, we don't have time to get too into it. I wonder if, uh, I don't know, one of these offensive tackles like a Lucas Niang or a Wanya Morris don't stay at tackles once the season starts. And hey, maybe now you have a tackle moving into guard that's an option. So I think my first choice would probably be the second thing that you mentioned there. I think throwing yeah. Morris in at guard would help him with some of the things that he struggles with at tackle occasionally. And the thing is, like, when you watch Morris play, because that guy's got some power. Like, so I, you could kind of, I can see a vision there. Now, the offense would have to change the way it operates, right? Because he is not a similar player to Joe Tooney. But, and, and the funny thing with Morris, and I tell people this all the time, his high-end snaps, like his good snaps, are, like, awesome. And then his bad snaps, you're like, holy crap. Like, we, well, this is this is not good. Like, check out the Vegas game sometime for both. Um but I think I would pick Morris and line him inside and change the offense a little bit and say, look, Trey, Creed, Wanya, let's run some teams over. Because now suddenly you've got, I mean, that would be some powerhouse middle of the line. I think, and I also, I kind of liked Hunter Norzad's film, uh, his college film. I think you get a little bit of maybe some like-for-like skill set there. Again, no one's going to replace Joe Tooney. But he seemed like a really sharp player. He's played all over the line. So I think he he, he would be my second choice there. No, I I like that. I like Norzad. I, I very Allegretti esque and like being his age and his experience, he might be ready to play early. So like that's I think that's a right. guy that would probably get an early uh, nod as well. Um, Corey Peter asked um, for both of us apparently, why are we the way that we are? And like I, but Corey, you, I, I'd have to get to that question to start the show so we can go fifty five minutes on just that. We don't have time to answer that one here. That's a, that's a long that's a long yeah. answer right there. So, yeah. No, that's ooh, okay. That's. That, that's completely our fault, and it's too long to answer. Oh, yeah. Um, I got two more here. The quick one here from Lee87. I think this will be quick anyway. If you were to be in a home run derby, how many home runs could you hit in three minutes? Lee, let me tell you. Something I have learned since I have moved to North Carolina. I have continued to work out, but I no longer play sports that require any form of like uh, rotation. So when I played golf like two times over the past decade, and let me tell you, my backswing is terribly stiff. And I almost look like Charles Barkley trying to swing a golf club. I am sure trying to swing a baseball bat for a home run would look the same. I would hit zero home runs in three minutes, given the opportunity to. (laughs) Absolutely zero for me as well, because uh, everything you just said, and I was never as athletic as you in the first place. I don't know if you've recently tried to hit a hit a baseball. I if it's been a minute. I tried. It was like a wiffle ball. It was a whole deal, and I was like, "Oh, I'm washed, washed." Like. (laughs) Like you, like that's something I didn't realize. You know, I kind of, you know, you pick up a basketball after three or four years, you know, it takes 10 minutes to kind of kick off the rust. Swinging a bat, nope. And so I absolutely zero, and I would, I would miss like half the pitches. It would be horrifying to watch. I save myself um, when I play with like my kids because they're still young right now. And like we're doing like T ball or like a soft pitch and stuff. Like I always swing left handed. So if it's bad, I have an excuse. 
Uh, then nice. they went like, I hit him like, ah, see, I did that left handed. Cause like, you know, I tried to teach myself that. It's like purposely teaching myself to swing left handed. I can dial back into the instincts of swinging right handed. I'm sure are gone right now. Um, <laughs> we were asked to design a play to get uh, Luis Resamet the ball in the red zone. I, I don't know if that's great for the audio. So I'm just going to say, like, I think they're going to, if he's on the roster, you'll get something like they do with McCole Hardman where yeah. they motion him. Like the corn, you're going to get the corn dogs up. Tony Harden, whoever it is, corn dog stuff for him makes a lot of sense or using him for the shovel pass in like a McKinnon area, like uh, style of player. I think that's it. I know we got to slip out of here. If you have a quick answer you want to get in there, you can, but I feel like it's probably probably something like that, a shovel pass or like a, a return motion kind of thing. Absolutely. And I think uh, an, an easy one also is, you know, they, they went a little bit away from jet sweeps last year, mostly because teams yeah. really started to hold in on them, which, by the way, means to, yeah, I know, which to me means that, you know, with Reed, everything's cyclical. And so it wouldn't shock me to see that come back a little bit more. Um, he's got from, and we don't know, right? We don't know what it looks like in pads. Based on his athletic profile, it looks like he's got the burst to hit that corner. Um, and doing what he's done, he should be able to sift his way through traffic. So I think some of the jet sweep stuff, similar to what you're talking about too, though, uh, I mean, the expectations on that kid, I feel bad for him. Now I've actually seen, Nate's got a running joke how good looking he is. And I've seen him and he looks like he's like maybe 15 and I feel for him. Like, I'm sure he's a consummate pro, but I was like, man, I'd like, and now again, I'm getting very old, but I was just like this poor kid, like the expectations that are being voiced on him. Just let the man play special teams in year one. Yeah. Let him make yes. the team. And, and given the new rules, I'm surprised we didn't have a question on that because it's like the biggest change to football at the NFL level in like a decade. Yeah. And I'm so excited to watch that. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, yeah, we'll see how it plays out with him. I hope he gets to go on special teams and find his footing before asked to do too much so no fans are disappointed. You all, none of you, I hope, are disappointed by any of our answers. Or, hey, maybe you guys all are, and I am sorry for my bad answers this week for you guys if that is the case. <laughs> However, we appreciate it all. We appreciate you guys listening. That was 21 questions. Seth, take it easy. I am glad we got to hang out and do this uh, for the first time here under KCSN. Hey, me too, man. This is really fun. We, we got to do it again sometime work on my baseball swing. All right. Thank you guys. Later.